Hello and welcome to chapter seven, our episode seven of Reading the Victorian Novel. I'm Dr. Christian Lehman, and this is Great Expectations. Today we will be covering chapters 40 to 46. So in chapter 40, we're in London, and we finally learn Magwitch's name. We no longer have to call him the convict. In 41, also in London, Herbert is brought into the conspiracy of Magwitch. In 42, Magwitch tells his own story. It's a really remarkable chapter for that. Then 43, we go to the village. Pip and Drummle have a fight, sort of, in front of a fire. 44, we're back at Saddest House. 45, in London, don't go home. And then Wemmick's advice. And then in 46, we head out to Mill Pond Bank and establish a place for Magwitch to be. So let's talk about Magwitch's three names. His um, birth name is Abel, right? That's his Christian name. <clears throat> so he's given this biblically resonant name. Abel was Cain's brother. He was murdered by Cain. He was a shepherd. And he's also, and then we have a pun on Abel. So the point here about being a shepherd, right? That connects to Magwitch's time out in Australia. The idea of being able, he was capable, right? He got all of this money. Uh, and then also this kind of Cain and Abel thing. We learn about Compeyson. And there's a sense that like Compeyson versus Abel, uh, almost a biblical battle between these two men. Magwitch, the name itself, is doubly magical. It's made up, as you can see, of mage and witch. And so there's something very interesting about kind of the, the magic ability of Magwitch to survive and kind of get around. Um, and right, he goes to Australia, he escapes back, he's out of prison ships, uh, but he's also kind of a fairy godmother of Pip. Oops. And then Provis, <clears throat> two words kind of come to mind for me. One is proviso, which is a condition or a statement that makes a stipulation, uh, a command. Um, and so in the delivery of the great expectations and the inheritance, Pip was told he has to keep the name Pip and he can't ask about who his benefactor is. So Provis provided provisos. Also relevant is providence, this idea of the protection of God or good luck. Now we also see um, in terms of like why Pip and suddenly Pip is plucked out of <clears throat> obscurity and given this fortune. So the name Meg had kind of been in Dickens's head. And if you know Peter Carey's book, Jack Meg's, which is kind of Great Expectations and Australia, a rewriting. Um, but here I have a few things from Dickens's book of memoranda, which was a slim book that he kept in his pocket and he jotted down names for plots, for sentences, and a lot of names for characters. And so down here, you see he has Meg, he did a little check mark. Here it is just enlarged. And then also there's the name Provis, Meg Witch. And so there's, um, <clears throat> you can kind of see it working around in his brain for a while. And here at last, he had a chance to use it. In fact, it had been working in his brain all the way back in 1849 when he was planning David Copperfield and he was thinking about calling it Meg's Diversions. <clears throat> and he had a whole sense of what that would be. Um, Meg kind of maybe also pointing to Meg Pie, uh, theft, a number of different things. Whatever associations you come up with, it's fun to play the game of onomastics. Onomastics is the study of names where it's kind of symbolic and thematic resonance. Okay. When Megwitch shows up, he is compared to a hungry old dog. He ate in a ravenous way, very disagreeable, and all his actions were uncouth, noisy, and greedy. Some of his teeth had failed him since I saw him eat in the marshes, and as he turned his food in his mouth and turned his head sideways to bring his strongest fangs to bear upon it, he looked terribly like an hungry old dog. So this recalls the first time Pip watched him eat which is over here on the left, all the way back from chapter three. I had often watched a large dog of ours eating his food, and I now noticed a decided similarity between the dog's way of eating and the man's. The man took strong, sharp, sudden bites, just like the dog. He swallowed, or rather snapped up every mouthful, too soon and too fast, and he looked sideways here and there while he ate, as if he thought there was danger in every direction of somebody's coming to take the pie away. So there's a, a consistency, but... 
what I think is happening is there's less judgment in the first one comparing him to a dog. So in both of them, he's comparing him to a dog, which has kind of the ideas of dehumanization with it. But in the first one, he kind of empathizes with it and tries to figure out um, that he is looking. The second one, though, notice he's calling it very disagreeable and specifically uncouth. That is not mannered, noisy, and greedy. Other things that ask us to compare these, right? The specific mention of the teeth, the strength of the teeth, the strong teeth from before um, are no longer strong because they've fallen out. That use of sideways, this kind of angularity that we get presented with. So why do I bring up this issue of the knife, or not the knife, of bad manners? Because in between that first simile and this one to the dog, Pip learned manners. Um, and he is especially struck um, in an uncomfortable way, made uncomfortable by Megwitch's eating off of a knife. This is Megwitch speaking. I dropped my knife many a time in that hut when I was uh, eating my dinner or my supper. And I says, here's the boy again. How looking at me, Will's I eat and drink. And then later, he was on my lips to ask him what he was tried for, but he took up a knife, gave it a flourish, and with the words, and what I done is worked out and paid for, fell at his breakfast. The implication being that he ate with his knife. You will remember that this recalls young Pip learning to be a gentleman. This is Herbert. True, he replied. I'll redeem it at once. Let me introduce the topic, Handel, by mentioning that in London, it is not the custom to put the knife in the mouth for fear of accidents, and that while the fork is reserved for that use, it is not put further in than necessary. It is scarcely worth mentioning, only it's as well to do as other people do. So what I can point out here is Handel was humorous, um, jocular even, but incredibly gentle in correcting Pip and teaching Pip the use of manners, not being uncouth. Remember, this is the original bolter of his food. Uh, but he now, he, Pip, does not extend that same grace to Megwitch, part of that class-ness. Um, so this is not um, a very important point that I want to make here, but it's the shift of the first-person possessive adjective, my. So early on, right, in chapter three, uh, page 37 is what I have here, but I've pulled up Gutenberg where I highlighted my convict. So it shows, like, in Pip's brain, he kept saying, my convict, my convict, my convict, kind of um, possessing him in a certain way, harmlessly, more or less. But now he's confronted with somebody else that has thought this way the entire time and now vocalizes it and has made it uh, incredibly uncomfortable for Pip. So this is Magwitch. I mustn't see my gentleman a foot in, in the mire in the streets. There mustn't be no mud on his boots. My gentleman must have horses, Pip. Horses to ride and horses to drive and horses for his servants to ride and drive as well. Shall colonists have their horses and blood ones, if you please, good Lord? And not my London gentleman? No, no, no. We'll show him another pair of shoes in that, Pip. Or won't us? So Pip had kind of viewed his convict as being um, my convict, but he was separate from him. Whereas now he's confronted with Magwitch thinking about my gentleman and being one with him, wanting to be connected. And here again in this passage here from chapter 40, we just have the same idea of Magwitch trying to use Pip for uh, an instrument of revenge. So here's a, a kind of nerdy issue in that there is a very slight textual variation on page 330. Six in chapter 40. This is Pip talking to Jaggers. And Jaggers asks if everything has um, been going, like if Pip knows the truth, right? If he's like, have you checked everything? And Pip says, in 1861, which is the serialized version, I have verified my information and there an end. In 1862, Dickens clarifies this slightly to I have verified my information and there's an end. And there is an end. So um, the book ends up printing this second one, The Penguin, and in the note, it actually says it may be preferable without elaborating on it. This becomes a really exciting issue, right? You can start sitting around and being like, which is preferable? Which text do you think creates what you want to read? So in my opinion, I actually like the first one. 
So the way I read it is I have verified my information and verified their unend, right? So it's like these two things come together. He has made all of the decisions about how this situation is going to end. And that is the end of his expectations, the end of using that money um, and anything like that. But I have verified my information, comma, and there is an end suggests that it's a, a, something maybe more permanent, more direct, or he's not going to look into it any further, right? It kind of points to, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's exciting. There, like, is it the um, verifying the end or is it just being an end, kind of everything stops versus alternatives? Um, if you're thinking about this in terms of what might be going on with Estella, that could be what is there, verified an end, right? Leaving that verb out, he's verified, there is no hope with Estella. So it's something to sit around and talk to your friends about, which is the stronger reader reading, um, because it's so incredibly minute uh, and thrilling. I'd be remiss not to talk about Frankenstein. This is the chapter in 40 where it becomes explicit. The imaginary student pursued by the misshapen creature he had impiously made was not more wretched than I pursued by the creature who had made me. And recoiling from him with a stronger repulsion, the more he admired me and the fonder he was of me. So it's kind of interesting that we have creature used twice here and Pip kind of, it's making a reference, a very clear reference to the Frankenstein. Um, but he first says he's the imaginary student pursued by the creature. Then he switches it and he becomes <clears throat> the one being created and the creator is a creature. So it's pretty fascinating kind of rewriting of the Frankenstein story, which at this point only 60 or so years, 70 years um, is a myth in a lot of ways, right? It's a very common, like really kind of has built itself into the cultural knowledge of the 19th century. So there's a lot of other Frankenstein that's in here. Um, Ian Crawford has drawn attention to some of it, misses a great deal of it, maybe just didn't have space to explore it. Um, but you, I'm sure, can find others. If you look for ideas of electricity, you'll see some really interesting ideas that are there. So just to make this comparison to a direct moment in Frankenstein near the end, um, because one thing that's yeah, kind of clear by doing this is the Arctic in Frankenstein becomes kind of the marshes or London in the Great Expectations. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice among which I had walked with caution. His stature also as he approached seemed to exceed that of a man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach, then close with him in mortal combat. So just one of the many moments of the acknowledgement of the, the creator and the created. Um, and you know, keep in mind like that we also had a Stella being the creature of Miss Habisham, there's a lot of other things kind of going on here in terms of horror that underlies the, the story of a young aspiring gentleman. Chapter 42, Magwitch's story. This is the most um, remarkable beginning chapter in the book because for an entire chapter, Pip steps back. Magwitch takes over. The entire thing is narrated from him. So it begins, dear boy and Pip's companion, I am not a going for to tell you my life like a song or a storybook, but to give it you short and handy. I'll put it at once into a mouthful of English. In jail and out of jail. In jail and out of jail. In jail and out of jail. There you've got it. That's my life pretty much down to such times as I got shipped off. Outer pit stood my friend. So uh, Victorian novels were sometimes published in triple deckers. Stories have beginnings, middle and end. And I think it's just marvelous that when Megwitch summarizes, in jail and out of jail one, in jail and out of jail two, in jail and out of jail, three. So it comes in threes. Um, first person saying that generically what he's not going to do and then what he does. Um, and it, it begins kind of with Pip in some ways in the same way that this book did. 
and he has an audience. Um, so it's really remarkable. I think it can be uh, um, effectively and interestingly compared to Little Dorrit's Miss Wade, who in that novel is given an entire chapter from her, this letter, it's an embedded document that we're presented with, but it's her voice that dominates the chapter. So the narrator steps back and she says, I have the misfortune of not being a fool. From a very early age, I have detected what those about me thought they hid from me. If I could have been habitually imposed upon instead of habitually discerning the truth, I might have lived as smoothly as most fools do. Um, so I'm just trying to like, you know, point out some of these moments where um, tension arises over narrative control uh, and other people are given a voice in a novel that's otherwise dominated by a different voice. All right, on to issues of race. This is all about um, the issue of Megwitch being in Australia. So a little content warning here of race and racism. Not to go into the things that Compass and planned, and I'd done, which would take a week, I'll simply say to you, dear boy and Pip's comrade, that that man got me into such nets as made me his black slave. I was always in debt to him, always under his thumb, always a working, always a getting into danger. In a very recent uh, interesting article, um, a young, um, young Japanese scholar proposed that this reference to the black slave is specifically a reference to the civil war that is happening over the issue of slavery in America. And in fact, yeah, by saying black slave, it is making it very clear that this is going to be racial chattel slavery and that they're aware of it. Um, Britain had abolished slavery. We've talked about this in earlier episodes. And so it's almost extra horrific that Megwitch is saying, hey, it's still going on. Um, it's a combination, though, of class and almost feudalism here, serfdom with I was in debt to him and so I had to be working and doing these things rather than the um, complete chattel. So he then also, while he's telling the story and comparing himself to a black enslaved human, is smoking a kind of tobacco that is called Negro, N-E-G-R-O, head tobacco. This was, as Elaine Friedgood has pointed out in a really astonishingly interesting article, a Australian loose leaf tobacco, or not to loose leaf, it was like compacted down and adulterated so that it could, it could last for a long time. It's illegal in Britain at the time, and so Megwitch is actually like a smuggler in an interesting way as he smokes this, but it's named after um, the idea is that the plug of tobacco looks like the natural hair of a black person. And so in some ways he like gains control and consumes this commodity. Um, and in Elaine's argument, it's really uh, interesting. She compares the consumption of that um, tobacco to the, um, genocide of the Aboriginal Australians. And so it's a practice that by going out there, right, Megwitch talks about being in the bush. He talks about doing that sheep for farming, but he had to displace and the Aboriginals had to be murdered in order to do this. And so these are things, these are tensions, these are destructions that underlie all of this novel, things that Pip has been protected from, things that Herbert has been protected from. Right? He's sitting there blithely imagining going off to America and hunting buffaloes. We talked about that earlier, um, ignoring the indigenous genocide that was happening. He also wanted to engage in this trade, this idea of expanding the army. Pip himself thinks briefly about going off to India and performing uh, or joining the, the army that's out there doing the action of colonizing. And Megwitch was actually there as a product of that colonial empire where he was a, a penal slave, and then he got his freedom. Uh, all right, so I have here uh, a very, you know, Sigmund Freud, this kind of quote that's attributed to him. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, but I'm about to suggest that it absolutely is not a cigar in this case. So in the space of three pages on page in chapter 43, Pip stands up next to Drummel and they vie for space. By degrees, it became an enormous injury to me that he stood before the fire and I got up determined to have my share of it. I had to put my hand behind his legs for the poker. When I went up to the fireplace to stir the fire, but still pretended not to know him. Is it a cut? Said Mr. Drummond. Oh, said I, poker in hand. It's you, is it? How do you do? I was wondering who it was who kept the fire off. With that, I poked tremendously and having done so, planted myself side by side with Mr. Drummond, my shoulders squared and my back to the fire. 
So the fire, right, this kind of like <clears throat> stereotype of masculinity, uh, heat, warmth, life. These two men are going to vie for it in the same way they're going to vie for Estella's favor. Um, another form of light, the star. But this specific idea, right? He puts his hands behind his leg for the poker. There's like one phallus and whoever can wield it is going to have uh, chief masculinity in this moment. Over the course of this argument, Drummle can, uh, gets the absolute the upper hand in all of the insults that happen through this. There's this great sort of Pip saying, like, I'm thinking about you, thinking about you. And Drummle responds, I don't think about you at all. And at the end, when Drummle leaves, well, doesn't leave. When the waiter had felt my fast cooling teapot with the palm of his hand and had looked imploringly at me and had gone out, Drummel, careful not to move the shoulder next to me, took a cigar from his pocket and bit the end off, but showed no sign of stirring. Um, so he take, regains control of the phallus, but then he bites it off, which is a kind of symbolic castration of what he has just done to Pip. As Drummel leaned down from the saddle and lighted his cigar and laughed with a jerk of his head towards the coffee room windows, the slouching shoulders and ragged hair of this man whose back was towards me reminded me of Orlick. So here is this beautiful chart that I have drawn and it shows the doubles of Pip. Orlick is the first double we have seen. Um, he's from the rural area, he is poor, his word is he slouches and he vies with or Biddy's affection. Biddy gives him absolutely zero attention. Drummel, is the rich version of this. He's in the city. He's rich. His verb is lols, L-O-L-L-S. -L and he's vying for Estella, whom he does get. So it's just kind of, you know, helpful maybe to look at how clearly laid out these doublings are. Pip as a reader. Though she looked steadily at me, I saw that she was rather confused. Estella, pausing a moment in her knitting with her eyes upon me and then going on, I fancied that I read in the action of her fingers as plainly as if she told me in the dumb alphabet that she perceived I had discovered my real benefactor. So what we have here is just like Pip is constantly interpreting, right? And he's doing it in an imaginative way. Estella has told him she does not have fancy. She um, is all reason, all practicality. And he's sitting here fancying, thinking like, using this kind of ableist language of thinking that it's like he somehow sp speaks sign language because he says it's like being told to me in that way, doesn't. Um, and he just puts all of this on her. And then though, I know it's, it's a rough line, but oh my God, is it an amazing line when he confesses his love a few pages later. Out of my thoughts, you are part of my existence, part of myself. You have been in every line I have ever read since I first came here, the rough, uncommon boy whose poor heart you wounded even then. So an incredible line, right? Everything Pip reads, and we know he is an extraordinarily prolific reader. He sees Estella in that. We also know that he doesn't just read books. He had just said he reads in her fingers. So everything he does, everything time his eyes are open almost, he is reading. But he's not interpreting, sort of. He does interpret, but he's badly. Um, here we have a precision in the point of grammar. Anyone might have seen in her haggard face that there was no suppression or evasion so far. Pip. But when I fell into the mistake I have so long remained in, at least you led me on, said I. Yes. She returned again, nodding steadily. I let you go on. Was that kind? Who am I? cried Miss Havisham, striking her stick upon the floor and flashing into wrath so suddenly that Estella glanced up at her in surprise. Who am I, for God's sake, that I should be kind? So Pip wanted to put the blame on her. You led me on. She changes it, but it kind of keeps the same sound. I let you go on, right? You led yourself. You have to take responsibility for this because Pip is looking around trying to find ways to get out of taking responsibility for these things that have happened. Another piece of very tight grammatical um, change, and this is at the visual. This is now between Estella and Pip. Estella, yes, but you would not be warned, for you thought I did not mean it. Now, did you not think so? Pip, I thought and hoped you could not mean it. You, so young, untried, and beautiful, Estella, surely it's not in your nature. Nature is capitalized. It is in my nature. My is italicized. Nature is all lowercase. She returned, and then she added with a stress upon the words, it is in the nature formed within me. I make a great difference between you and all other people when I say so much. I can do no more. 
So Pip is trying to universalize nature. He's like, the world should exist how I want it to exist. And I have put these things in place. Universal. She responds, no, it is particular. Nature is particular and individualized. Hence the italicizing of the my and the getting rid of Pip's capital N. Similar focus on grammar. It's kind of the theme of these slides. You would never marry him, Estella. She looked towards Miss Havisham and considered for a moment with her work in her hands. And she said, why not tell you the truth? I am going to be married to him. So in Pip's brain, he's asking, you wouldn't do the marrying. Estella responds with the idea that she is a passive um, vehicle for Miss Havisham's revenge. I am going to be married to him, right? She's not saying she's doing the wedding. She's turning herself into the passive object that's being transacted in this moment. Quick classical illusion in 45. So 45, um, Pip has been received a note, we learned later from Wemmick saying, don't go home. And so he goes and spends a sleepless night in the hammams, which are based on Turkish baths. So there's a whole other orientalizing thing that's interesting there. But he says, when I had got into bed and lay there foot sore, weary and wretched, I found that I could no more close my own eyes than I could close the eyes of this foolish Argus. And thus in the gloom and death of the night, we stared at one another. So Argus was a hundred-eyed creature that Hera put in place to guard um, Io, who Zeus lusted after and had uh, been turned into a cow. Um, so Hermes comes down, puts this hundred-eyed creature to sleep, and kills it, chopping off its head, becoming known as the Argos Killer. Then Hera takes the eyes and puts them in peacock feathers, and that's how we have peacock feathers, so a little etiology there. But... It's a story, it's an illusion, both about sight and watching and surveillance, which is fueling Pip's paranoia at this point, but it's also an erotic story. It's about guarding females and jealous women. So it's not an accidental illusion. And it turns Pip into a Hermes creature, a Hermes-like god, but kind of an inept one. All right, we're wrapping things up with Captain Cook. So in 46, they go to Mill Pond Bank and establish um, Megwitch in Clara's dad's house. And there's a, an establishment there where people can stay. Mrs. Wimple runs it. This is in her house, boarding house. I looked at the corner cupboard with the glass and china, the shells upon the chimney's piece, and the colored engravings on the wall, representing the death of Captain Cook, a ship launch. And His Majesty King George III in a state coachman's wig, leather breeches, and top boots on the terrace at Windsor. So this is the death of Captain Cook in Australia and Hawaii, hands of the indigenous people. But we also have the beginning of Captain Cook's career. Back on page 333, chapter 40. Nor yet, this is Megwitch. Nor yet I don't intend to advertise myself in the newspapers by the name of A.M. Come back from Botany Bay. And years have rolled away and who's to gain by it. Botany Bay was the place where Captain Cook landed that eventually became the site of the first colonial um, presence there. Um, they had to move a little bit away, what is now Sydney, but they still called the entire region Botany Bay. And so in the space of six chapters, we have the history of kind of Captain Cook laid out. But why this picture? What's the obsession with it? And why do we get it at this moment? Well, it is a story about the consequences of colonialism and white overreach and kind of white hubris. It's also a story about return because Captain Cook had landed in Hawaii safely, left, came back when his mask broke, and that's the point at which he was killed. So Magwitch has also left and now returned. So are we being asked to think about Magwitch as a potential Captain Cook? Here is the illustration, most likely, that they had. So this is The Death of Captain Cook by John Weber. Here is Cook. You'll see he's holding out his hand. He's being stabbed by the men in the back. So there's kind of um, stereotypes of cowardice. Um, the British are far outnumbered. The indigenous population is shirtless. They're performing the, the violence. The men here, they have their, their guns. They're struggling. So it's an incredibly racist popular image, but it's also very weird how popular it was. But it's, a, you know, I think carries the sense of somebody that is in Britain can feel pride in the empire and the great glories and the exploration, especially, you know, you look at the palm trees in the background. This is not what Britain looks like. Here's another version of the popularity of the image. 
kind of being spread around, but I do like the detail that the one we're looking at is colored. So here's it zoomed in. There he is, right? Trying to say, halt, don't do this violence anymore. Getting stabbed in the back. This fellow is picking up more rocks to continue doing it. Um, and with that, we end this episode. Thank you.